policy was set up in the Virginia colony and then also later into South Carolina. It's called meritorious manumission. Meritorious means to earn, manumission means to release. So a black could earn his release from slavery if he did one of four things, or a combination, elaboration, or sophistication of those four things. One, if he could, if he could uh, 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 prove to whites that he could see things through the eyes of a white person, and he'd prove it by one, saving a white person's life, two, saving a white person's property, three, inventing something or improving the, 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 the profits that he'd get from picking cotton and corn or tobacco, or four, if he would squeal on and tell on any other black person who was trying to escape from slavery. That was called meritorious manumission. We still got blacks in America that's working hard and diligently to get meritorious manumission. <laughs> They're working hard to make sure that they protect a white person's property. I don't care, and they protect it by any time you come out with an affirmative action program. I have the dubious honor of being the person that wrote that first affirmative action plan for the state of, for the state of Florida in 1971 that went all over the country, a comprehensive plan. I didn't write the plan for minorities, poor folk, Asians, Hispanics, Arabs, midgets, humpbacks, lesbians. I wrote it for black folk. But immediately, the whole, the whole frame of reference is the way you keep black folk down is always the loot and water something and make pretend it's for everybody. And that way, anything for everybody is for nobody. And so they took that minority program, the affirmative action program, made it a minority program. And see, now I want the affirmative action program to die for that reason. In 1999, I go down to, go down to Texas, and a program was written for black folk. I look, at, I look at the amount of money in state contracts in Texas that year, and white women, white women got 78%. And nobody in our black leadership, in our black overclass, in the black civil rights movement ever said, hold a second, how are you going to put white women into a minority, into, a, into an affirmative action program set up for black folk when she was well, right along with the white man? She co-owned, co-controlled, co-influenced, co-herited, and everything that the white slave owner had, she had it too. She sat in the same house, on the, under the same table, had, slept in the same bed and raised his kids. How, does she, how is she entitled to be competitive with black men or black people in the society? But our black leadership didn't say anything. So white women went into the affirmative action program and took it over and dominated it. That's why you go to check Coca-Cola about, about three years ago. Coca-Cola company, almost 66% of all the money on a minority program went to white women. And in Texas, I, it, 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 white, uh, white women got 78%. And Hispanics got 21% and blacks got nine-tenths of one. Because, again, we don't know how to play the game. We keep buying into, this, into these myths about, people, about these very broad, ambiguous groupings. And all of that stuff started immediately after the Civil War. Now, and, and guess what? Then they wrote the Constitution. No black leaders make this point. The first con We got two constitutions in the United States. We got the first one that was written and codified in 1789, and we got another one in the 1860s. The first Constitution was an affirmative action plan. It is an affirmative action plan for whites. And you hear white folks always talking about they're against affirmative action plans. They're only against affirmative action plan for you. Why? You see, because I wrote the other affirmative action plan, I wrote it in 1970 when I was over say the education system for Florida. I did not write an affirmative action plan for everybody. I wrote that plan for black people. I did not write that plan for minorities and poor folk and people of color, midgets, humpback, lesbians. I wrote it for black folk. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because see, affirmative action was supposed to be corrective action. Correcting something that the system and that the government has done consciously, historically, and continuously against a very specific group of people. That's what confirmative action is. Then why in the world do you all keep letting people put you in a bag called minority? No government hasn't, hasn't done anything in the minorities. Why are you letting them put, and put in there, comparing you and equating you to gays? And, well, now they're getting all the benefits, and Hispanics, Hispanics weren't even in the country. Now, and you go to the affirmative action plan, guess what? I got Eskimos in the affirmative action plan. <laughs> when did Eskimos pick cotton? They had nothing in the world to do with affirmative action. The government hadn't done anything to them. And you go into an affirmative action program, the affirmative action program had been totally corrupted. 
The only people that should have been on the affirmative action plan in the first place were black folk. Because those are the only people that the government done some things to specifically exploit, misuse, abuse, subordinate, enslave, Jim Crow, segregate, castrate, lynch, and do it and deny them education. Only black people. And you gotta go look at the affirmative action plan, they got everything in there except your dog from the neighbor's yard. And I don't see any black speaking up about it. They'll go right down and call, well, I'm a minority. How the hell you get to be a minority? What's a minority? I don't know what it is, Dr. Dennis, but I know I'm one. Because <laughs> they call me one. <laughs> and, I'm, and then leaving that point, I'm telling you, it is illegal and unconstitutional for, for you to equate anything to black folk in this country and make them equal. There is no constitutional basis to have any Asians, Arabs, Hispanics, women, gays in affirmative action programs or preferential programs. It is legal, legal. but I haven't seen one black person, not one black person, go to court and raise hell about it. As a matter of fact, I have whites that tell me that they were totally, absolutely surprised that when they started doing that, that no blacks spoke up and raised cane about it. They just sat there and let it go down. That's why back in 1970, with the affirmative action plan, when I wrote that plan, they turned around immediately and came up with a thing called Title IX. Because throughout history, every time you try to do something for black folk, they would throw other groups in there to water it down and dilute it and give it to everybody so blacks wouldn't be anything left for black folk. And they come up with Title IX. How are you going to spend those money now since we dig for black people and they got, got Title IX? Every county, all 67 of the letter back says, any money comes out here, we're giving it to women. Now the penny would go to black folk. No black folk raised cane. None of them said anything. They went down like that. That's what happened to your money. Because you see, and, it, and guess what it's backed by? It's backed by the United States Supreme Court. One of the most racist organizations in America. One of the most racist institutions in America is the United States Supreme Court. And I still cease with a total, absolute amazement as to why black folk keep going to the court system. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. The deck is stacked by the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court has never, 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 never ever done anything and benefit black folk. Never. And they are going to do it. You've had the first 57 to 58 people appointed as justice to the United States Supreme Court were slave owners. And everything subsequent to the 1860s, they were either white racists or people who were totally indifferent to black folk. They're one of those two, even to the present time. They're either racist, closet racist, or they're totally indifferent to black folk. They don't care about black folk. And what they've done is to make sure that the social construct of what was set up in the, in the Constitution about your being property and three-fifths of a human being and non-competitive will stay in existence. The guardians of racism in America is the United States Supreme Court. That's why when the second Constitution was written in the 1860s, and you had a few liberal whites, radical, radical Republicans those days, said, we got to correct some of these things that's going on. And they, they crafted the second Constitution. The second Constitution was made up of the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. And they also passed two civil rights laws, the 1865 and 1866 civil rights laws. They passed those laws all for black folk, newly freed slaves. They passed them for newly freed slaves. The Supreme Court jumped in immediately. And they used that same little schemes they used today. The first thing they did was say that all those civil rights laws that were passed from 1865 all the way up to the 18, and to the 1880s, late 18, about 1889, all those civil rights laws were unconstitutional. Nobody gave them authority to do that. The United States Supreme Court does not have the authority to do what it's doing to you all right now. It doesn't have, even have authority. But you don't see the black, you got all these black with law degrees. You, don't, you see one raising hell about it? The United States Supreme Court does not have the authority to mess over you the way they're messing over you. That's why they've never done anything in your favor. They don't have that authority. Congress is, a, is the person that sets the rules and law. They are the elected bodies. Nobody elects anybody to the United States Supreme Court. They're the closest thing to royalty in this country, where they get a lifetime job to do nothing but sit there and mess with people <laughs> based on their own personal prejudices. 
and get away with it because nobody raises Cain about it. They don't have the authority. And so, and, and, but they, they, so they, they, they didn't do anything after the Marlboro and Madison case back in 1803. Then here, jump up to 1857, and here comes a case called Dred Scott. In the Dred Scott case, a black man then was trying to get his freedom, having moved, gone from, moved from Missouri to Illinois. And the, and the Supreme Court, it went to the Supreme Court. And, and Justice Taney ruled in that, being the Chief Justice, says that in the final ruling in the Dred Scott decision in 1857, said a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. That case, that issue has never been overruled. Well, are black folk progressing in America? No, you're not progress. That's why they're shooting you down. That's why they're shooting down a black man every other week in some place in the United States or beating a black woman. These are just the police alone. Dragging you out of cars, beating black women on the street, shooting black men. Why? Because the Dred Scott decision is still in effect. It's still in effect. That you have no rights because the decision was never addressed. And the, and the real sadness and irony of this, and I look in the newspaper, I look, in the, look on TV, and here comes my people down the road. Guess what they're doing? Wearing signs, hollering, yelling, screaming, and saying on the signs, Black lives matter. They never ask the question, black lives matter to whom? To whom? I look on TV every day, and there they are walking with signs, black lives matter. To, they never say, to whom does it matter? You got a law saying you don't matter. And more importantly, if you understand the nature of the system, you would know that you don't matter. Why? Because you see, in American society, and in a capitalistic society, value of life is based on what we call personal net worth. When you go to a bank, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to fill out what? A personal net worth statement. Net worth means what are you worth? That's why you hear people saying all the time, John D. Rockefeller is worth. Henry Ford is worth. Bill Gates is worth. They are telling you that value is what you're worth is based on what? What you own and control. And since in black folk we only control less than 1% or 2% of anything, that's why whites say we aren't worth two cents. Because we don't control anything. We control less than one and a half or 1%. How in the world can you justify how people have been in the country for 500 years and can't even control 1% of something? It's because of the social construct you're locked into. You're locked into it, bottomed up. And how did that come about with capitalism? Let's go back to what I said a few minutes ago. When they decided to build racism in as a, by commercializing black folk into slavery. They commercialized black folk in Europe and started that race. And when the race ended and they, and they maldestroyed all the wealth, they, they took the E off of race and struck ISM. ISM means is a, is a suffix which says maintain the prevailing conditions. If whites had used slavery to acquire almost 100% of all this nation's wealth, resource, privileges, controls of all levels of government into the hands of the white society, racism means let nothing change that condition. That's what you're locked into. Racism means as a group phenomenon, whites own and control at almost 100% of everything of value in the society, 87% is frozen. 87% of everything in society that's owned right now by whites is frozen. It is locked into their communities, locked in their businesses, locked in their culture, locked in their neighborhoods, locked in their schools, locked in their churches. 87% is frozen. You can't get it. That means that the average white child, he is now, he can now has an 87% advantage over a black child. Because everything that a white child needs to be successful in this society is in his community, in his church, in his business, in his neighborhood, in his schools, in his family, in his culture. He can get it anytime he wants to. He inherits it. It is passed on from one generation to the next. Every child gets what he needs at birth. Now, the disadvantage for these black children is that you have never owned anything and never controlled anything. And what you can pass on is what you cannot inherit. Because, you see, all of our black leadership have had us focusing on things that are non-inheritable. 
You cannot inherit food stamps. You cannot inherit public housing. You can inherit a job. Every time I go to a civil rights organization, they say, what are you doing to enrich black folk and give them something to pass on to their children? They say, well, we're going to try to get blacks some jobs. You can, why, how are you going to pass on a job to a black child? Why don't you build some businesses with stock, elder, and wealth and pass that on to them?